Hi everyone, my name is Jacob D'Souza and welcome to another part of Atkins Realis Leadership Series where we're going to explore what Canada needs to do to reach its net zero targets. About 80% of the world's GDP is committed to one net zero target or another and we are two in Canada. It's going to involve a massive electrification of society. About three times more power will be needed by 2050 in Canada than it does today. So the question is, where is this clean power going to come from? We know nuclear power is going to play a critical role. It's a clean base load power that can produce a large amount of electricity at once. But how are we going to do it? What kind of nuclear power and what type of reactors will we bring online? And how exactly can we get them built in time? I'm joined today by Gary Rose, Executive Vice President of Nuclear Canada for Atkins Realis. Gary, thanks very much for joining us. Glad to be here. So Gary, we hear about nuclear power a lot in the news. I hear you talking about it from media, from politicians. Why is nuclear power being talked about with such a renewed vigor to meet our energy needs right now? Well, I think in this, this future of a net zero world, nuclear really provides clean energy, affordable power, and energy security. So when you think about uh, all the different uh, energy solutions available, nuclear really checks all the boxes. It, uh, it, it can be deployed in almost any location, and it's carbon free and clean. That's the real key reason why nuclear is part of the conversation these days. So Gary, we know there's a number of different types of nuclear reactors that countries can choose from. They vary in size and output, large reactors, SMRs. Can you walk us through a bit about each of those, what they do and what their uses are? Uh, when we look for the future, when you want to decarbonize everything, and you start to look at uh, how can I uh, use nuclear to decarbonize smaller grids or to decarbonize industry or to displace diesel, um, multiple different nuclear technologies are available. So we have micromodular reactors which can displace diesel in small remote indigenous communities or, or mines. Um, we have small modular reactors which can be used for uh, areas where you need lower amounts of electricity and or in industrial decarbonization scenarios where uh, steam, high temperature steam is actually what is, the, what is desired out of, the, out of the nuclear plant. The small modular reactor provides both steam for industrial processes but also electricity. And, and then you have, um, have uh, large nuclear, which will continue to play a role in societies that need large amounts of, of electricity. And you think about Canada, where we believe we need 55 gigawatts of electricity to meet uh, our net zero goals. We're gonna need a combination of large reactors, small modular reactors for both electricity and smaller grids and industrial decarbonization, as well as micro-modular reactors for uh, remote communities. So with Canada needing to triple its power by 2050, if we assume that nuclear power took up about 25% of that mix, which is a realistic supply demand forecast, we forecast that it would mean building 45 SMRs and 20 larger Canada reactors by 2050. So those are the numbers, Gary. My question is, is that actually feasible? Can we actually do that? Yes, I, I believe it is feasible. In fact, we've demonstrated that it can be done. If you look back in the history of the CANDU reactors here in, uh, in Canada, we installed uh, 23 CANDU reactors in 22 years, so more than one a year. So the key question is not is it achievable, the key question is how do we do it? And there are a couple things that we need to do to, to make this happen. One, whether it's an SMR or a large reactor, standardization of the design is key. Right out of the start, if you have a standard design that you can replicate over and over and over, and it will make life a lot easier to achieve these goals. And what I mean by that is you do the regulatory process once. Yeah, there are site-specific environmental assessments that need to be done, but you license this reactor once. You don't have to do it multiple times. You set up an organization to deploy a reactor one after the other. So you plan for this larger program versus project by project approach. And when you're talking about a program of that many reactors, you then start to excite the supply chain that step up, they build the capacity to meet that type of a program. The worst thing we can do is talk about one nuclear reactor and we don't get the excitement and the interest in it. When you talk about 20 plus or 30 reactors, whether they be large or small, you build excitement, you build programs to kind of stand up uh, supply chain capacity to meet that need. So Gary, when we hear about utilities that either perhaps don't use nuclear power or not very sure about it, utilities, governments, and the public, I would say, the three biggest concerns that they typically have are safety, waste, and cost. Can you walk us through your thoughts on each of those factors one by one? You know, quite frankly, the nuclear technology is getting safer and safer as we, as we move forward. 
Um, for example, the, uh, the Kendu reactor and many other reactors have multiple shutdown systems, what we call defense in depth. If there's a failure of one system, there's defense in depth that there's a secondary system in place to shut a reactor down in the case of, of an event. So, you know, we learn, we're a learning organization. We learn from the past and we implement uh, solutions, lessons learned, we call operating experience in the nuclear industry to improve our performance in, in the future. But overall, uh, nuclear technology is extremely safe. When it comes to cost, nuclear, when you consider the fact that these plants will operate for 60 to 70 years, is a very low cost of, of energy. There is a, a large capital investment that's made at the beginning of these projects, and then there's a long-term operation of fueling, which is, which is actually very, uh, very economical overall. And when it comes to waste, uh, to me, uh, waste, uh, nuclear and the waste story is the most misunderstood part of the nuclear phenomena. Um, for, I'll, start, I'll say this, first off, the waste that's produced in a nuclear reactor is extremely small. So if I got all of my energy, uh, in a lifetime of energy from a nuclear reactor, the amount of waste that's produced from that, from, from that reactor to provide me with all that energy would fit in a soda can, a very small soda can. So its, it's amount of volume is very low. The second thing that's, that's uh, unique about uh, waste management in nuclear is we know where all the waste is. It's very well managed and has never harmed anybody. The other technologies can't say that. If you're running a coal plant, the waste is in the air and unfortunately, it's harming people. Uh, if you are in a solar plant or a windmill, when those plants get decommissioned, the waste goes in our landfills and can harm the environment. We understand that the, the uh, waste can be consequential, therefore we have great programs to manage it very well. When you think about long-term waste storage, in Canada, we have the Nuclear Waste Management Organization, which is accountable for managing the nuclear waste from all the reactors in Canada and they have a program to put in a deep geological repository, which is a safe program. It's a type of program that is used internationally, well recognized, will have the, the, um, the right regulations in place to make sure that there is a long-term storage to, to uh, prevent any harm to the environment or the people in, in the management of that waste. And finally, when it comes to um, a can-do reactor, a can-do reactor can use used fuel from other reactors as its fuel source. So we can reprocess used fuel for the purposes of generating additional electricity from a can-do reactor. So Gary, last question here. We know that nuclear assets last a long time, up to 70 years, maybe longer like at Pickering, but they typically take 10 years to come online in Canada, from first application to when the power switch actually goes on. Climate change is not slowing down for us, it's not waiting for us, so what can we do to actually get these nuclear assets onto the grid quicker? So, so you're right, traditionally uh, nuclear deployments have taken about 10 years to deploy. And I would say as we look forward and think about a fleet of reactors, we can, we can shorten the, the cycle um, quite extensively. Um, so the first one might take up to 10 years because the first one you're gonna develop the standard design and the standard processes, go through the licensing process, et cetera, for the first time. It's gonna take, you know, it's gonna take a huge amount of people uh, to be involved to make sure that we're making the right decisions on that first reactor. The reality is that about a 10 year cycle, about half of that is permitting, siting, etc. The next half of it is the actual construction of the reactor. But if we can standardize the design, standardize the safety case for that design, we should be able to replicate that over and over. So uh, on a site, we would do licensing for a site and deploy two, four, six, eight reactors at that site. That starts to allow you to get a reactor at one a year after that first one, one is deployed. And as you go to other sites, um, start to look at how much of that information from the previous deployment can I replicate to reduce the timeline. And it's not about cutting corners. Each site will have its own requirements to do environmental assessments and to get community support. But you can leverage over and over and over the information from that first deployment. That's all for today, but thank you Gary very much for being with us. We hope you enjoyed it.